Welcome everyone to the Nagalieri General Ability Test, Verbal, Nonverbal, and Quantitative. My name is Kim Lansdowne and I am a co-author. I also um, am the Executive Director at the Herberger Young Scholars Academy at Arizona State University. Um, very often as uh, uh, we're presenting, Jack, Dina and I, we get the question of how this all began, like well, how, did, how did we get to where we are now? And, and um, it's, it's important to note that all three of us have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, Dina and I started working together, gosh, 25 years ago at this point um, in Arizona and on the, the state board um, of AAGT, which is Arizona uh, Gifted Children Conference. And uh, we were doing our dissertations. So Dina and Jack and I um, started working in the early 2000s on this idea of how to assess the underrepresented populations that were in our districts. And so we, we came together to um, do this, this and, and it's been a long time coming. And so we are just absolutely thrilled to be able to be here today and to present this to you. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dina Burius. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, as Kim said, I've been in the school district for about 20, 25 years as a, as a gifted coordinator. And I'm currently the director of gifted at Paradise Valley Unified School District in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm also the gifted program coordinator for the ASU gifted master's program where Kim and I both teach. So as Kim was saying, we've been batting this idea around for a very long time. And we're so pleased to be able to say that it's come to fruition. And that's what our session is gonna be about today to explain our new tests. Thank you, Kim and Dana. I'm Jack Naglieri, and I am officially retired from the university uh, since 2010, but I've continued to work as a speaker and as a test developer. And people ask me, why do you still work? And I say, because I believe in this, in this goal, this goal of equitable assessment, and I have the wonderful opportunity to have two amazing co-authors, and we've been able to accomplish something that never has been accomplished before. And it will make a difference in the lives of many children. So that's why I keep working. And uh, for me, it's all about, you know, achieving a goal for so many students out there. So um, I will get started and give you a sense of, um, how did I get interested in equitable assessment, especially as it relates to gifted, but equitable assessment in general? And uh, it's, uh, I think it's kind of ironic that um, my first university teaching job was at Northern Arizona University, but I never met Dean and Kim until many years after that. They were there then, but uh, in any case, I had been interested in intelligence testing since the mid 70s when I first started working as a school psychologist, giving a WISC, giving a Stanford Binet. And I noticed that those tests demanded a lot of knowledge, knowledge of words, understanding of directions, verbal responses that were required. When I went on for my PhD at the University of Georgia, listen to Alan Kaufman talk about assessment and that things like vocabulary and information really were more like achievement, just like I had been thinking. But it really kind of hit me when I started working in Northern Arizona University and I was supervising students who would do an evaluation of, for example, kids from Second Mesa, the Navajo population. And then a colleague of mine did some private work testing in the Supai village inside the Grand Canyon. So we went to this little village and started assessing students there with the tests that we were taught to use, WISC and, and such. And I remember thinking, this 
doesn't make any sense. These students don't have the, the background knowledge of English and the such to really be compared to a national standardization sample. The, the next slide shows a report that I wrote. I actually still have this report from the early 80s. It was using the WISCAR, so it gives you a sense of how old this is. This is 1981, was um, the date tested. And in, in my report, I explicitly said that the score that the student got on the verbal side of 52, which is very low, that it did not indicate how smart this young woman was and that the score cannot, and I put not in all capital, be considered an estimate of intelligence simply because she speaks Supai language, not English, very little English. So at the time, this was really almost, um, you know, like blasphemy really to say, oh, the WISC doesn't measure intelligence. Um, but quite simply, it doesn't. And so a couple of years um, down the road, I, I published a couple of papers. My first paper on equity was a 1982 paper, and then a paper with Cecilia Yazzi, where we made this point very explicitly. A few years after that, I published my first two measures of ability, which were called the matrix analogies test, individual and group. And with these tests, what I wanted to do was measure ability in a way that's not confounded by what people know. So that's the whole diagrammatic approach to item writing. But interestingly, what I found for these first studies, in these first studies I did, no, no gender differences, no differences by race, but still strong correlations with achievement. In other words, good validity without the differences. Next slide shows you. I saw when I published the next edition of that nonverbal test, it was changed to the Naglieri nonverbal ability test in 1997. I, I did the same thing with the, with the data we got from standardizing and validity and all that. Again, we found strong correlations between this nonverbal test and reading. We found trivial differences by race and ethnicity. And Donna Ford and I did, I think, in many ways, the most important study yet to that date, which was if you look at the actual number of students identified based upon a nonverbal, this nonverbal test, you get equal percentage of Blacks, White, and Hispanics. And again, on the next edition, the individual edition, we looked again at race and ethnicity and ELL status, and again found similar scores. So you keep replicating, right? And replication is the key to, do, to really having a good knowledge base. So with the NNAT2, again, we looked at the correlation between the NNAT2 and the OLSAT, basically a group of administered WISC like the COGAT is, strong correlation. Strong correlations with reading, but small differences by race and ethnicity. In other words, we have good validity, that's the correlation to achievement, but small differences by race, ethnicity, and so on. And even a strong correlation with the Wexler nonverbal scale, which I was also the author of. So I have this long history of research that consistently showed after group of group or thousands and thousands and thousands of students that you can measure ability more equitably if you take out all that knowledge. But people kept asking, what about the verbal and quantitative tests of general ability? What about those? And that is where the three of us as a team really put our efforts more recently to come up with three measures, a verbal, a nonverbal, and a quantitative measure of general ability. But we wanted 
these tests to have characteristics that would allow everybody from the student in the Supai village to the student who lives in, in inner city, any inner city in the country and so on and so forth. So what we're gonna be talking about today is how we make identification of gifted children more equitable, but we need to clarify a few things. First of all, we're gonna be talking about finding gifted students. In other words, very smart students and distinguishing between a gifted student and a talented student. I remember so vividly having this conversation with Kim and Dina some years ago. And when they languaged it in this way, it made perfect sense to me how it fit with what we've been doing. And, and we really, then that's the beginning of what became what we'll talk about today. So you can be gifted and talented, gifted and not talented, and talented and not really gifted. Donna Ford has spoken about that many times, and I certainly very much agree with that. So what we're gonna be talking about is how do you take the knowledge out of the measurement of ability? So we wanna use a test of ability that is not gonna be confounded by what a student knows. So in all those talks, after all those years when we were grappling with how do we measure um, how smart a child is, their potential for learning, their high ability, um, without, without the knowledge base. And so what we came up with three different tests, verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative, that just completely removed the language out of, out of those tests and still able to identify that potential, that ability in those different areas. So we're gonna describe what those different tests look like at this point, Jack. So the big picture, here's where we started. We started with an explicit desire to construct tests for equitable identification so that students from diverse cultural, linguistic, and socioeconomic backgrounds would all be assessed fairly. And I, I wanna just go on a little bit of a tangent here for a moment. When the three of us presented this idea to the publisher, a publisher that's not as well known in um, the gifted world, so to speak, published called MHS, Multi-Health Systems. Um, they're in Canada. And the, the, the audience that we spoke to was very diverse. And they so resonated with our desire for equitable identification. It was, it was really a wonderful um, experience to be so you know to be so accepted by a, an entity that we need to be able to do this, we need a good company, and and they they saw what we were doing. So we said we want to measure verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative, and we want and and when we do that, we're going to be measuring one ability, not three abilities. We're going to measure general ability using verbal content, general ability using nonverbal content and general ability using quantitative content. So we wanted the test questions to be constructed in such a way that they did not require academic knowledge. We wanted the verbal and quantitative questions to be easily solved using any language. And to take out the comprehension of verbal instructions. If you think about, if you've ever given any of the group administered tests like an OLSAT or a COGAT, the amount of verbal instructions are, are you know, huge and the number of verbal concepts in those verbal instructions are really pose a problem for children who don't speak that language very well. So what we did is we created animated instructions. And we're gonna show those to you so you'll see what they look like. And of course, we didn't want to require students to verbally express their answers because that also is a knowledge base. So we have all multiple choice. And to just be up to date with how kids are today, 
we have online administration. We will uh, have paper administration at some point, but we are doing an online environment. And Dina? So I was, I had the um, privilege of developing the, the verbal test back in, in this trio. And basically it's, it's um, based on Alexander Luria, a, a psychologist who developed the theory of language cognition, basically how people develop language regardless of the language that they're speaking or the origin or where they live. And it's based, based on conceptual understanding of universally recognized um, concepts that we are that we then use to try to, to try to develop these test items that are similar, but there's some distinguishing differences. And so regardless of the language that the student speaks, they're still thinking with language, they're thinking with their own language. And there are some concepts that are, are basically that we had identified that were universally understood. And we use those to uh, create the items and in the verbal test, for example, the student will be see will take a look at these these pictures and decide which is different from the others. When the animation starts, a thought bubble comes up. The six images appear. Five of the images move together, and the chair image kind of pulses, and then that. The little avatar here moves his, his or her hand. As the hand moves, the cursor moves. The click is on the number five, which is obviously incorrect to show how you can correct it. And then click number four. And then they click the gray arrow to go to the next item. So that's how the student knows what to do. So um, the nonverbal scale is like the ones I've done in the past, except I've created a whole bunch of new ways of making items. Um, I did that for a couple of reasons. First of all, for me, it's just a lot more fun to come up with new ideas, uh, new ways to build matrices. But also I, I like to have um, certain people not know what the items look like, right? So um, that's why I did that. So what we're getting at, is in order to answer the question, which one of these is the right answer, you have to look at the relationships between the four. Just like in the verbal test, the student need to look, needed to look at the relationships among the six to decide which one is a different verbal concept than the other five. Here, the child needs to look at the relationships among these shapes to understand how they relate to one another in order to arrive at the answer. And in the animation, in this, what happens, again, a thought bubble comes up. The first thought bubble focuses on the top part. In other words, directing the students to look at the top part of the image. And that goes away. And then the five options appear in the thought bubble and the correct answer pulses. And then that goes away. And then the student does the same thing. They come over, they click on the one, and then they click on the arrow to get to the next, to the quantitative test. So the quantitative um, portion that measures general ability really just uses numbers and symbols. And so um, prior to my life um, here at the Herberger Academy, I, for a long time, was a math teacher. And so, like, I speak math. It's my language. Um, and, and Dina will attest to that. I am, I am constantly thinking about numbers and symbols and shapes. And, and so we really approach this um, in the simplest way possible. Students do not have to have a lot of academic mathematical knowledge. The calculation requirements are very simple. And so we are using um, different ways of assessing students without language. And I know we say this again and again and again, but um, as a coordinator of gifted programs for a long time, um, I was responsible for doing assessments and it was very challenging for me to read a very, very, very lengthy explanation um, regarding the, the quantitative portion of an assessment 
and then move into having so many words that were involved in solving quantitative reasoning problems. So the um, portion of the quantitative assessment has the animated directions again. And so the student looks at the problem, uh, goes through the, the answer um, selection and decides what that is. So the student selects the with the cursor and the arrow moves on to the next set of questions. So it's very important to keep in mind that even though these tests have different test content, the three tests have different content, what they all measure is general ability. It is not measuring verbal intelligence or nonverbal intelligence, or quantitative intelligence, even though you've People have said that, that's not what's happening here. All the tasks re require a student to examine information, to do some kind of uh, reasoning of, uh, to understand the relationships among the parts or things or ideas. That's what we're getting at here. So before we go on, Dina, I love how you talk about this being a paradigm shift because you, talk, you, you do this so well that I'm gonna ask the question um, that teachers have asked us for years and years and years. So if a child scores high on the quantitative reasoning, does that mean that they are specifically going into an advanced math program or how do you, how do you manage that in your district? I like, to, I like to lose sight of the area in which they identify because I do believe that it's general ability. These are different avenues for um, measuring that general ability. Some kids are going to be stronger in math. Some are going to be stronger in, in verbal. Some might be stronger in some spatial. But they're all, it's, it's that the end result is that they have high ability. So I don't want to say if somebody's uh, identifies on a quantitative battery, then the only thing they're going to do get is advanced accelerated math. I want to, I believe that that ability crosses over to how they uh, perceive all information. And general ability, uh, we can talk about it in, in a minute, but really allows us to solve all kinds of different problems. It, it, it involves reasoning, memory, uh, sequencing, um, insights, making connections across content. If the child is able to get to the, a high score on one of these tests, I believe that I strongly believe that they will be able, they should be exposed to all types of acceleration, all types of in-depth other ways of learning and not just isolated into that one single area. So what we do is measure the general ability, then group the students together, then use some academics to see where they are advanced academically. And then we can, we can further, along, uh, further along those areas. But I, first, I want to make sure that, that we are recognizing them, that they have the high ability that crosses over into all different areas in school and in learning. And by grouping the students together and exposing them to some of the different, um, different instructional methods, strategies, uh, then we can really take that ability, potential and develop it in all areas where the child is, is, um, need, has the, that, that advanced learning needs. And we can do that just by measuring the general ability. And just to clarify, remember, if you've studied the history or, uh, of intelligence testing and you've read any of Wexler's original work, I mean, he, he never talked about the differences between the test, his portion of his test as different abilities. And as Alan Kaufman wrote in the Wexler nonverbal scale, that Wexler believed the verbal and performance scales, verbal and nonverbal, represented different ways to access general ability, sometimes referred to as little g in the literature. But he never believed in verbal and nonverbal intelligence as being separate from g. And he saw the performance or nonverbal scale as the most sensible way to measure general intelligence with people with limited proficiency in English. And in the next slide, I'll bring you back even before Wexler's definition, the people that Wexler relied on, for example, like Pintner and Joachim and Yerkes. Pintner in 1923 wrote, we did not start with a clear definition of general intelligence, but borrowed from everyday life a vague term implying all around ability 
and we're still attempting to define it more sharply, endow it with a stricter scientific connotation, 1923. I think very importantly, what we uh, agree with to the nth degree is what Pittner wrote 100 years ago, a good intelligence test must avoid as much as possible anything that is commonly learned. In a broad sense, this rests on the differentiation between knowledge and intelligence. So in the next slide, I'm trying to help people recognize that whenever you present any kind of a task to a student, whether it's a test or classroom work, a formal test, standardized test, a classroom test, whatever, it's important to ask yourself, what does the student need to know to complete the task? And if you can list those things, that's the knowledge part of the task before the student. But then there's the other part is, how does the student have to think to complete a task? Like for example, if you're giving a reading comprehension test, if the student can't read, then that reading comprehension test is about reading, not even the comprehending part. But if, when, if the student can read it, and the question is what's the best title for this paragraph or this story, where the comprehension of the interrelationships of all those pieces and parts are necessary, that's the thinking part of it. So that's why we describe, and Dean, I know you wanted to speak to this a little bit more. We describe general ability as we did in our book. So this book was published, I think we wrote it in 2008 and it probably just came onto the market in 2009. We've been talking about this for a very long time about measuring general ability. And I'd like to just point out that a lot of times I've used the NAT for many, many years in different districts. And a lot of times people will say, oh, that's that's spatial reasoning or this, that, and it does, they don't equate it to general ability. So like I was speaking about before, we had this seed planted since then, but they're knowing that the general ability encompasses more than spatial understandings and relationships. And so when we, when we, percolated over this for about a decade or so. We, um, Jack, we were wanting to find a way that we could convince others and help show others how general ability crosses all these different domains. And just because there's, it's a non identified and a nonverbal doesn't mean that they don't have strengths in math or in reading or other, other, other areas. And so that is what led us to where we are here. We started thinking and talking about it and thinking there's got to be another way to make sure that we're getting these kids. And so that's where, that's where that all started, but um, it led us to where we are. So you might be thinking, oh, this, all this talk about G and general intelligence, that's really old. Um, and it is, but there's a lot of new research that's been done. And this, is, this slide is just one of probably close to 50 studies that Gary Canavay, Marley Watkins, Tim Brosky, Ryan McGill, and, and uh, a number of other people have done using very sophisticated new kinds of factor analytic methodologies to answer the question, does a multiple scale test have enough parts that are justifiably interpreted? Um, and their answer has been no. In other words, the score that matters the most is the total score. And the part scores are not supported. So this, is, this has been the case when they analyzed the WISC, when they analyzed the Stanford Binet, the differential ability scales, the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive, um, different editions of them, the Spanish WISC, uh, Canadian WISC, and on and on and on and on. So there's a lot of support for this concept of G. And even though it's an old concept, it's newly, you know, it's newly supported. If you look at what we've been doing in the field of gifted, on the next slide shows this, 
Um, this is uh, from uh, Ed Week, he did a research uh, study on a lot of aspects of what's happening in our field. And the thing that gets my attention here is when they ask what factors um, were addressed by the district's definition of gifted and talented, it's clear gifted and talented, intellectually gifted, academically gifted. So this spread that we talk about, gifted, really smart, talented, really knowledgeable, something that is consistent with what we see elsewhere. But what's really interesting in the next slide is if you look at the tests that are most often used, with one exception, all of those tests demand a lot of knowledge. The COGAT, the OLSAT, of course, the Iowa Test of Basic Skills that is a knowledge test, Woodcock-Johnson, and of course, the only one that doesn't is my nonverbal test. Now, just to kind of drive this point home a little bit more, you might be wondering, well, can you, you know, give me an example? So I'm going to give you, I think, the best example of what I think is exactly the wrong way to build two tests that are supposed to be different. An ability test and an achievement test. So Woodcock does this. He has his ability test and his achievement test, right? And these have been around for a long time. I've, I've known Dick Woodcock for decades. I have a lot of respect for him. I just don't agree with him. So on his intellectual test, the cognitive test, there's an oral vocabulary subtest. So let's look at the question. So um, it says, the examiner points to big on the subject's page and say, tell me another word for big, okay? So the student can say and get correct for large, gigantic, and huge, all right? Now, on the achievement test, his achievement test, there's a reading vocabulary synonym subtest. And look at the example that they provide. Point to large on the subject's page and say, tell me another word for large. Answer, big, enormous, gigantic, huge. This is, this is simply wrong. In my opinion, it's simply wrong. You can't put the same damn question on two tests and in one case say it's a measure of ability and another say it's a measure of achievement. You gotta make up your mind. What are you trying to measure? And this is not unusual. In this slide here, I've pulled together for the Stanford Binet, for the WISC-5, the WJ, the KBC, the OLSAT and the COGAT, all the sections all the subtests, the areas that have a lot of knowledge required. This has a big impact on how certain children perform versus others. And I just wanna draw your attention to one thing. You know, there's a lot of verbal comprehension required for the group administered tests. There's a lot of verbal expression required for the group administered tests. The OLSAT and the COGAT, of course, being group, uh, sorry, individual, the OLSAT and the COGAT being um, group administered where the child doesn't have to speak, but the amount of verbal instructions on those tests is really crazy. And verbal instructions demand listening, remembering, and understanding. So that's a big, a big problem. But here's the evidence of the problem in the next slide. This is a table from the book that Dina and Kim and I wrote that will be coming out in a matter of months. And what I've been able to do here is pull together all the research studies that are out there on race and ethnic differences for all these tests. If you can find another study like this, I'll be really surprised, let me know. But I've scoured the research, this is all we know. So if you look at the top part of the chart, you see Otis Lennon, Binet, Whisk, WJ, Kogat, and then you see race and ethnics. Now, what do those scores mean? Those are the standard score differences between by race or by ethnicity. So a, a, a 14 point on the Otis Lennon, that's almost a whole standard deviation. So that's a really big difference. All of these tests demand knowledge as I've just explained. On the bottom, 
I have the cognitive assessment system, which is one that I published that does not require knowledge. And you can see the differences are much smaller. And, the, and that, again, the differences are much smaller. And then our three tests, I'm gonna show you this um, in a few minutes. And you can see when you take out knowledge out of the measurement of ability, the differences that you see across race and ethnicity are dramatically lower. I think that we as psychologists have done a real disservice to society by overvaluing our first conceptualizations of intelligence way back in the early 1900s and have misled people into thinking there's really much bigger differences um, than there really are. And, and the differences are more about the test than about the people. And here's the thing, if you, if you listen to people talk about, for example, the whisk, I've heard for the last number of years, a famous person who I won't name, who says, oh, the whisk doesn't have any test bias and the differences are real. Um, that person never gives the full story. The full story is that if you look at the standards for educational psychological testing, it's very clear that they differentiate between test bias and test equity. And how do you determine if you have test bias? You look at things like reliability differences by race and ethnicity, item characteristic curves by race and ethnicity, factors invariance by race and ethnicity but they don't look at mean score differences. It's the mean score differences that are relevant when you look at equity, because as the standards clearly um, communicate, the content of the test is the foundation of equity. If a student has not had the opportunity to learn the content on a test of intelligence, that test can be considered unfair, even if there is no evidence of test bias. In other words, separate from test bias is the question of test equity. So when I show you mean score differences, that's about equity. Now, how much of an impact that does this problem have? This is a question I became, um, really interested in. So here's the basic, the basic uh, takeaway here. Um, there are many children out there who may not be doing well in school, maybe don't speak English very well, don't have much advantage, that, that limits their knowledge base and therefore their scores on a WISC or a COGAD or an OLSAT. That doesn't mean they can't learn when given the opportunity to learn. It doesn't mean they're not smart. They can be really smart, but the test isn't revealing that. So how many children are there like that? I became really interested in quantifying this a number of years ago, because I most people were talking about, oh, Blacks and Hispanics and Native kids are, are underrepresented by this percentage. And I wanted to know well, how many people is that? You know, how many people really are there? So I just went to the you know internet, got all the data on number of students in the US public schools by race and ethnicity. I used 8% to, to figure out how many kids we could consider as being gifted. I know some people say the top 10%, so I was being conservative, I said top 8%. Then I got the numbers of students who are actually in gifted program by race and ethnicity and just made a simple comparison to, and then added it up to find out that the total non-white number of students is about 850,000 people. Think about that in K to 12, as of 2018, three quarters, more than three quarters of a million 
students who are really, really smart, could have been identified, but weren't. And a big factor is the test that we used and how those data are integrated into decision making. So here's the thing, we can do better. And with our new tests, we've already done three studies. Now replication is always important in any research, right? That's why I showed you in the beginning all that information about how I replicated with the nonverbal test, 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 test. What we did here is we had three separate studies. If you notice, the sample sizes are always about 2,500 or higher. A verbal sample, quantitative sample, and a nonverbal sample. The samples closely match the US population. The students' age range from kindergarten to 12th grade. No race differences, no ethnicity differences, no gender differences, and no parental education level differences. This is extraordinarily powerful data. This really so supports what we've been saying all along. And then to add to that, in the next slide, we also looked at the basic attributes of these tests, the psychometric part of it, the bias kind of stuff. Um, we get really good reliability. We get really good general ability uh, scores, correlations with uh, uh, my NNAT. Um, and when we look at the, at the item level, looking for, for bias by race and ethnicity and so on and so forth, using differential item functioning, we're not getting anything there either. So clearly these data show, tell us that we're, we're on the right track here. We're gonna talk a little bit more about availability and use and Kim's gonna talk about uh, local norms. This slide just provides information. The, the tests are currently available. They, we've started to use them. Uh, people are using them starting actually last week using the online format. Um, you can use the three separate tests. So you could use any combination of the three or all three together. All the scores are automatically converted to local norms, which, which Kim will talk about. And here's some contact information for us or for the, uh, the person responsible um, for publish, the publisher at the publisher, Debbie Roby. I was working in a medium-sized school district in the state of Arizona and uh, prior to working on my doctoral work, which Dina and Jeff were both part of as I was going through that. But what we were finding, and I, again, I wish we were in a room where we could talk a little bit more about this, but I worked in a, a school district, but with very differing uh, demographics across each school. And we were using national norms at the time. I think everybody was, right, Dina? You guys were way back then too. So we were using national norms to identify our students, which means that we were looking at the national demographics. Well, in all of the schools that I had, there was not one single school that matched the national demographics. And so in identifying students, the, the next level that was so difficult for me to really understand, and it was a district I was moving into, is that our FTE, our teachers who we hired to move into those schools as gifted resource specialists were directly correlated to how many students were identified. So it became this double layer problem. And so um, at, way back in 2005, I was using local norms. I didn't know they were called local norms at the time, but what, it, what we did was we didn't look at the school as a as a district anymore. We were looking specifically at individual schools and what their demographics were in that school. And so with a local norming procedures, and there's, there's a, a lot of work that's being done out there, um, we're looking at the scores for all the students in, in my case, it was in each school. It could be a district demographic. It could be schools. You could even narrow it down to determine who needs, which students are so different from the, the average or the mean that, that gifted services are, are warranted. Okay, again, this is from our book that's gonna come out shortly. These are real data, I didn't make up these data. Um, but the data 
it, it's actually reflects very much a, a school district outside of Dallas that um, I spoke to the director of Gifted and she described so beautifully what she had. And this is the kind of result that you get. If you have some schools in one part of town that are really different than another part of town for whatever reasons, okay? And you get this, what we call a bimodal, you know, two, two means basically, um, a distribution. So I wanted to actually crunch the numbers. And in the next slide, um, slide, we call them slides, they're not really slides anymore. But uh, in the next image, um, I've actually rendered the, the top portion of these data just to show exactly how it would work. Um, the leftmost column is all 100 students, the total sample. If we were gonna do a district-wide local norm, those are the values we would use to decide if a student is above or below the average raw score, which is the 29. In other words, the average number correct or not. But we don't wanna do that because we know we have two groups of people. That's why we have that bimodal distribution. So in the middle and the rightmost column, I separated out the first and second classrooms from grade three from the third and fourth classrooms from grade three. And as you can see, in the middle group, the average is 24, the raw number correct is 24.2 for 50 students, 51 students. And then on the, on the right, third, the mean is 34 for 49 students. Of course, that makes the total of 100. So the shaded area are the scores above 120 for those three groups of people. For example, this person, number 43, who had a 37, that was above the full district, but it was considerably above this, these classes that it was, this person was compared to. So that's why their score gives them a score high enough to be identified. And this is what happens with local norms. It's all about the reference group. And if we want a student to be compared to others more like that student, this is the way to do it. And it works. Hey, Jack, I think it's important to, to say right now because we have gone through this local norming process multiple times, but I think if you're new to this and you're watching these last few images, it may look confusing. It, there's a lot of support at MHS to help you go through this process. So if you are wanting some support and some help, um, the, we are available to you. Yes, we are. And that's why I, I like these, images to this discussion because to really explain exactly how it works so everyone knows exactly what's going on that's important and we should also mention that our tests that are coming out that are our, our new tests do not we don't rely on national norms at all right now um, we may later build that in but currently they're being used designed just for use at a building level at a school district level based on the, the demographic fact demographics at that, at that school. Yeah, and, okay. and I guess the really good news is we can do better. Yeah, and we have said this multiple times through, through this, but um, we can devise an assessment that can be solved regardless of the language a student speaks. Um, we have many, many, many examples of um, students that um, have done very well on this assessment. And so we're really excited about it. And the publisher information um, is, is here. I have a lot of experience with this publisher. Um, pub having published my autism scale and my executive function scale with them, I have tremendous respect for them. Um, and everything, that, everything that's happened as it relates to this has been just a pleasure to work with them. They're, they're committed to the mission like we are. 
you know, they're, they're committed to the, you know, why we do this. It's about the kids. That's why we do this. And they're absolutely brilliant people too. I think. And that too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and of course we do have a website explicitly on these three measures. So you can um, go to this website for any updates. The tests are available now. So um, we're always happy to hear from you as things continue. And I guess I'll just add with, uh, end with this. Uh, this is from Martin, the uh, Martin Luther King exhibit here. And I live near Washington, DC, which actually is where Kim and Dean and I first met at the same convention. And I uh, just like to end with this quote from Dr. King, make a career of humanity, commit yourself to noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a greater person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. Thank you all. <laughs>